again, and there may not be an answer for this, you have chosen to perform at a remove. If you are an actor, Ronnie's on stage telling the story. Mm -hmm. You perform at a remove, which has its own power and its own metaphor, which is very powerful. Mm -hmm. What is it about Ronnie that, I mean, I, when I watch you perform, I see you and I see the characters live. Mm -hmm. And I see you performing, but I see you performing through at a remove. Why do you think you chose that? Uh, it goes back to what I said about when I was sat down in theater school and told I would only play this, you know, versions of this physical equipment. Um, so by, by having these figures that exist for no other reason than to be those characters. You know, it's not like a, a puppet walks on stage and people say, oh, I saw her in Lady M last season and she was wonderful, you know, which, which we do. We see actors come on stage and we reference them to other roles or things we know about them and then we go into the character. These things exist only to be that serial killer or this old lady or this dog. So um, I have these great vessels that I can put all of these voices in my head into and and I just think it's the best conversation I can have on stage because I am actually having conversations even though it's solo work right. um, it's taken a long time to realize that if I just know how to stand back enough the conversation can happen if I'm right in the middle of it then it's about Ronnie you mean right in the middle of it emotionally yeah. when you're above yeah. if you are too invested in what's below you actually are below, and if you stay slightly at a remove, it takes place downstairs, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, and the same happens in writing, you know, which I've had to learn over time is, you know, I used to want people to like every character, and then I remembered uh, during Street of Blood, there was a character that I wasn't liking at all when I wrote him, and I polished him up and made him likable to me, and I killed the essence of that character, and then I had to just let him be him on the page. And the same happens when you're performing. You know, I don't, I don't always have to like what's coming out of those characters' <clears throat> mouths or my mouth. I just have to make sure it seems authentic when those characters are having their discussions. I mean, because we did a, a workshop of Billy Twinkle, of, of the script that ultimately was the script, with John Alcorn and Iris Turcott and I in a church hall that we rented for a week, so we would have a neutral ground. And they didn't laugh once. I thought I'd written something really funny, and they were just dour all week and nitpicking. That was the monologue version or the dialogue version? The dialogue version, but they didn't laugh once. And I thought I wrote some pretty snappy stuff. And that week ended with a public reading on a Friday night. And the place went upside down. And people were laughing and clapping. And, you know, I was like, why didn't you guys laugh all week? And they said, our job is not to sit here and laugh at you, Ronnie. I said, yeah, but you didn't give me any indication that it was funny. So had I not done that public reading, I would have thought, man, this isn't funny at all. Right, right. Billy Twinkle was actually supposed to be the Ronnie show without puppets. And that's what I announced it was going to be for years. And it was funny because when I said that, there was so much interest from people to put money into it. They were like, yes. And then I thought, what does it mean you don't like the puppets? What do you mean? It was going to be Ronnie's show without puppets? It was just going to be me playing all these characters with props and stuff. But it'd be a one-man show without puppets. And why did you turn away from that idea? Because I can't think of a world without having puppets. I'm a puppeteer. Right? It's natural for me to think, oh, what a great puppet that'll make. So um, I, it, puppets just horn their way in there. I can't do that. God forbid, if your hands were run over by the trolley car in Bathurst, would you then create that kind of theater? Well, we'd have to see if anyone would show up, wouldn't we? <laughs> of course they would. Uh, you know, I... Yeah, I would always Are we coming for your stories or are we coming from your work with the Marionettes? You tell me. I've never seen one of these shows. And what was your choice early on to remove yourself? To be, sorry, to be seen. Because, I mean, I have to share one of the earliest theatrical experiences when I was four, I think. I went and see the Salzburg Marionettes, Marionettes yeah. at, at the Eaton Auditorium. And it was a magic moment for me and I was caught forever and I still remember it. Well, many decades later, yeah. I remember the magic of that moment of those marionettes. It was an, a Mozart opera, I do believe. Yeah. They did it to sound. I can't remember it was recorded. Always, yeah. But the operators weren't seen. And my old boys weren't seen in their Why day. did you choose to be seen? 
Because um, I was cheeky. <laughs> and I was young. And I wanted attention, I think. I don't know, but it, you know, I it, when Theater of Marionettes premiered, I suddenly became the bad boy of puppetry, right? And uh, the first show was Fool's Edge, and I was down there doing this Commedia dell'arte piece in a full Renaissance, twisted kind of punk Renaissance look with hair extensions, and it was all about look at me, look how clever I am, and the puppets were short, strong, and they would sit on my feet, and I'd swing them, and. It was the whole package, and it was, it, I think it must have been um, shocking and funny and um, interesting. I got a lot of attention for that. So I stayed in the shows for a long time um, because that was my style, I think. And I think I wasn't always convinced the puppets would be interesting enough on their own, you know, in order to be in the alternative or legitimate theater. It had to, you, you know, you had to sell the guy. Um, what I'm interested in now is getting the guy a bit out of the way because it's that thing I mentioned about technique. Um, I think, you know, I've said this before, if, if you're fortunate, and it is fortune largely, to have a long career in anything um, or a good long run at something, whatever your profession is, the first half of that career is about developing technique and exploring technique and honing technique. But if you get a good long run, maybe the next half is about ideas. That you don't worry so much about technique. You know how to do it. Um, and so I think I'm just moving into the ideas phase now. And I don't need the guy to be down on stage with hair extensions to explore right. those ideas. I might be back down right. for the next show. It's, you know, Billy Twinkle, I had to be front and center because it was about a yep. puppeteer. I had to play him. Um, but maybe it was because I was so front and center in Billy that I went the opposite route for Penny Plain and thought, okay, for a couple of years I'm just going to go up. Would you ever think of disappearing behind a flat? Well, you know, the old school version is to have a proscenium around the marionette stage. I just don't think that would serve me vocally by playing into the masking, and I refuse to be miked. So I think I need to keep it open just for the, the vocal right. stuff. Right. 